welcome to my studio and welcome to another edition of Art Discussion with me, Adelaide Damoa. As you may or may not know, I am an artist and I really enjoy probing the minds of other artists to find out how they overcome the challenges that they have to overcome in, or in order to go on and achieve the things that they want to achieve in their careers, hence this series, Art Discussion. What I hope to happen with this series is that firstly I'm able to promote the artists in some small way on, on my modest channel and secondly that I'm able to inspire you the viewer to continue pushing for your dreams. Today's interview or art discussion is with a lovely lady by the name of Christy Symington. Now Christy is somebody who you could definitely say has art in her blood. Uh, her mother is a sculptor. She actually started started um, evening classes at the age of six, from the age of six to 12 with her mother. Uh, she was going to evening classes learning how to sculpt. But um, she actually didn't start her career as a sculptor. She spent 12 years in advertising and marketing. And it took for a major life change, which was the breakdown of a relationship for her to go back to sculpting. During that time when she was doing advertising and marketing, she actually lived in New Zealand and Australia. Uh, so that was seven years between New Zealand and Australia and the rest of the time here in London. But when she had that life change and she decided to take up sculpting again, she thought she would look at it for three months. Well, it's 20 years later and she's still here. She first went to Paris uh, where she was doing ad adult education classes. Um, and she also spent some time at Kensington and, and Chelsea College where she learned, somebody taught her how to, um, how to cast the hands and feet of babies. And that was at a time, age 30, 31, when all of her friends were having babies. So she was making money doing that, sculpting hands and feet. And she thought to herself, well, I could do this anywhere. So she decided to go to New York. When she went to New York, um, she ended up spending four years at the New York Studio School, graduated, graduating in 2001. While she was at the New York Studio School, she was selected to go on an exchange program back to London at the Slade School of Art. And after graduating from the New York Studio School, she went on to complete her MA in Fine Art at Byam Shaw, which is now Central St. Martins. Christy has some truly inspiring and really important work, I think. And she has shown in London, Paris and New York. And this interview actually starts with me mentioning her great grandmother because her great-grandmother uh, in 1927 went and studied art at the Slade School of Art here in London and at the age of 17 she became the youngest person to be accepted onto the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition. Christy comes from a line of very impressive female artists so that's where we start talking about female artists. I hope you enjoy the interview as much as I did. I felt very calm by the end of it. She's, such a, she's got such a soothing, lovely, calm voice. Anyway, enjoy. What you said before about your family history really got me. 1926, mm -hmm. your grandmother went to the Slade. Mm -hmm. And um, my thinking around women in the art world, uh, women in art, it's not that long ago that women weren't even allowed to go to university to make art. Mm -hmm. So for your grandma to go in 26 mm -hmm. is kind of amazing. <laughs> and to achieve what she then went on to achieve with at the age of 17 being accepted to, into the Royal Academy mm -hmm. exhibitions, mm -hmm. really, really epic. So you've obviously got it in your blood, right? Um, but in terms of women in art, and we know the figures, I think less than 5% of um, women represented in major art institutions in the Western world, and um, it being a patriarchal world, well, the world is a patriarchal world anyway, but yeah. the art world um, feels like there's a, it's a particular kind of thing. When you look at the figures, the figures speak for themselves. Mm. Um, have you, in your career to date, experienced any um, any kind of feeling whereby you felt excluded as a woman or not able to progress as a woman or some kind of glass ceiling? And if so, how have you moved past that? Because um, reading your history, you uh, you have done some pretty significant things in your career since starting at the age of 
31. Mm -hmm. um, so how would you say you have um, overcome that to achieve the things that you have achieved if you have felt that mm -hmm. um, there has been some kind of holding back? I think I think I would say that I would I would like to think that I have not wanted to see the fact that I'm a female artist as an obstacle and to just keep to keep going. But when I studied in New York I looked at a lot of female artists, bearing in mind I was in New York between ninety seven and two thousand and one. The work of Judy Chicago, a lot of those female artists who were the content of their work was saying, I am female. Yeah. And I have over the years, many, many times, literally voiced it in my studio when I'm working, thanking those women for having done that work that I don't have to, although I could, but I don't have to use that content of saying I'm female in my work, that they've given me the freedom to just work yeah. as an artist. So as I said, I, I, I try not to see it as an obstacle. Do I think it's actually prevented me or been there to hinder me? It's quite hard to know, isn't it? Because I don't particularly feel it has. I don't know if for major sculpture commission work, whether there is still more a comfort for, for the client if they feel that it's a male sculptor because big things require physical strength that maybe men have more. If it's still seen business-wise that they can manage the project. But of course we know that's not true for, yeah. all, for everybody, it is still possible. I haven't particularly gone for any major external public commissions. So I would sort of say no, mm -hmm. but I am aware that it's there. Yeah. Yeah. Just thinking about your career in general, what are some of the, the biggest challenges that you've felt that you've had to face and then how have you gone on to overcome them? I think as a sculptor of space, Space is one of the challenges because we need not only um, up and down dimension, we need the depth. So when you've made, you know, when you have a studio and the, the, if the works are big, literally just having them in your studio is going to take up quite a bit of space. There are quite a number of works that I've just had to lose over the years. I mean, when I moved from London to Paris, I had to get rid of work. When I moved from Paris to New York, I had to get rid of work. Get rid of how? Either you dump it. No! You give it away. That's better. It's better, but you know, in the early days, and I, you know, I didn't want my work to be a burden by giving it something like mm. that. By the time I left New York, I had life size figures, I had quite big pieces. There's no way I could afford to ship them. Mm. If I was going to ship, you know, what was I going to do with them? So we literally, I had a friend who had a van and we put them all in the back of the van and we went around Manhattan and we put them in place. <laughs> <laughs> and some of them stayed there for several years. Really? Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Oh. A number of them went to um, an artist collector, colleague, friend, who had some space, he took about 30 or 40 pieces. Wow. But it's it's good because it keeps the decks clear. Yeah. And as you can see in my current studio, when you don't move and when you're not forced to, to move things on, they start to collect. Yeah. As anything does. Yeah. Um, so space space is a challenge and space of course costs money. So as a sculptor I think of course it depends on your work, but um, you just need a bigger studio than perhaps a painting art. Mm. How to stay financially afloat and create your work, and my choice has been through teaching. Yeah. A lot of it, which I really enjoy. I love to, I mean, you know, teaching is sharing, and within a few years, those that you're teaching become your colleagues anyway. Yeah. So, 
um, I've kept in touch with a large number of students, and they, they are not students anymore, they are of course they are my art yeah. colleagues. So. Making the transition where the art can actually support you solely, I would say, is, that is a big challenge. Yeah. Because even if you can do it for a period of time, is it consistent enough? Exactly. Exactly. You have had exhibitions internationally, London, New York, Paris, Tokyo, I think, right? Am I correct? Yeah, mm -hmm. Tokyo. What would you say was the uh, achievement, if you like, that you're the most proud of and, and how did you achieve it? I think having, having solo shows are an achievement. They're something that take, you know, they take a lot of preparation. Um, where you have your show means you need to work with the people where you're having the event. Um, it requires quite a lot of planning. It also gets you to look at your whole, your whole body of work and where you are at that point. I've had only three solo shows. I'm contemplating the next one. I've had various bits of work that have put money towards um, helping for wildlife, in particular for tigers. I'm kind of proud for that because effectively I'm giving my my profit, if you like, to towards that cause. And where I'd like to go is to get something into a museum. Yes. Because that shares it to a, to a broader public. Yes. And if it's in your studio it's, and not being seen, then it's like not being shared. These <laughs> epic creations. Can you tell me about this particular pieces, all these pieces? I can, I can. This is a piece of Olaf Equiano. Mm -hmm. This current situation of Equiano in black and in white is a single piece. The original piece I made 10 years ago in 2008, when it was the bicentenary of the abolition of the Slave Trade Act, um, when I came across, well, there, was, you know, there was a lot of information that was put out about what had happened during the slave trade, and somebody that I came across was Olada Equiano, and I was absolutely amazed that I hadn't even heard his name, it didn't ring a bell. I, then went on to research what he had done and about his life and realised that a lot of people that I asked also didn't know. Whether they're black, whether they're white, whatever background. Mm -hmm. But he seemed to me to be absolutely iconic in Britain's history. So I decided to make a sculpture. And in the last 10 years, it's now been in a number of exhibitions, including to New York and back. And my intent with the piece is to share his name, share his life, and the book that he wrote. And the book that he wrote is known as the best account of the slave experience, um, and told many, many people around Britain the horrors of slavery and took place on the ships, which many people didn't know. Whenever I have the opportunity to show the piece, I show it. And then this current one, the black and the white, sort of comes across quite blatantly as showing a black man in black and white. And it should, I, I hope it not to be, to have, I hope for it to have other underlying reasons that, that graphically, in terms of looking at it, it's quite striking because it's black and white and it captures the attention, but underneath that there's meant to be more to think about. I mean, clearly he was not known about because he was black. He's been omitted from history. He... I do know now, there are quite a lot of people that do know about him, but I, I feel there are always more people who yeah. know about him. It's mainstream, isn't it? It's not mainstream knowledge, mm. basically. Thinking about the about the work, um, a lot of your work looks at black people, which is rare for a, a white lady, in my experience. Mm. Is there is there a particular reason? I mean, you handle the subject matter beautifully and very respectfully, um, but there is 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 there a particular reason why a lot of your work focuses on these themes that you would expect? Um, 
black artists to look at, typically. <laughs> I think I perhaps asked myself that question. The first head that I did was of Basquiat. Whether it was because he was a black artist or not, I don't know, but I, all I know is when I saw his work, I loved the work and I didn't understand why I hadn't heard of him. When I came across images and I saw that he died very young, I felt that I could, I, I just felt drawn to make the piece. I didn't really think about it too much, I just, I just did it. I don't think I particularly sort of set out to, except that I, I suppose when I made the Aquiano, I was so, so st struck that there, there, there were these sto stories that could be told and, and around the time of Equiano that then I discovered that there were other black people, people of colour, whose stories weren't told. And I wanted to take part in that. I wanted to take part in putting those stories across. So, you know, the intention with the piece is initially to raise attention that, that, that somebody gets drawn into the work and then says, oh, who's this? And so if one person goes away and does a bit of research into who that person is and then tells somebody else and they tell somebody else, for me that's success in my work. Yeah. Because that's the story I'm trying to, I'm trying to tell. Yeah. Yeah. Which brings me perfectly onto the next question. <laughs> what, is, what does success mean to you? What does success as an artist mean to you? What does it look like? I think success for me is when there is when your work goes somewhere and there and a connection is made, when it can potentially create dialogue, create discoveries, whether it's about the process, I mean we could be talking about people, um, but not necessarily. If it, if it's work that is more about um, the process of the work and another artist looks at the work and says, I really, that's really, that's interesting how that's, how that's done, or yes, that creates a certain emotion. I think when, when, when you get the feedback or you discover from somebody, it only needs to be one person, that there is a connection between the work that you produced and the person who's seeing it. Yeah. And many, you know, many, many people can look at a piece of work and have a completely different reaction. And they might react to the process, they might react to the person, they might react to... They, they might even be picking up something quite different to what you feel you're putting across. And yeah. to discover what they have felt from that is also interesting. So I think it's if the, if the work creates a connection and dialogue comes out of it, then I think it's... Think of that as success. Yeah. If you could go back to uh, thirty-one-year-old Christy <laughs> when you were just starting um, to pursue this path to where you are now, what advice would you give yourself? Not to worry too much about time. I think because I didn't go to art school in my early twenties, because I felt that I'd come to it later, and that everybody was ahead of the game with me, I felt I had to rush. I felt like I was starting off at the back of the race and had to, and was trying to get in with the, you know, the crowd. And, and, and I think I then, it took me two or three years to realise that time is not that sense. Time in terms of a year, two years, or even, you know, Time isn't really this, is, isn't really structured that way as an artist. In some ways, by starting my artwork later, I had a whole different life before that that then feeds into the work. Which, if you start off as a young artist, it can't be both, can it? Yeah. So I, I think it's about I think it's about time and not to feel that you have to rush. It will it will come in its own time. And I think particularly now there are quite a lot of artists who who are starting as a second career for one reason or another. Mm. Somewhere in there you're in built as an artist, I think, from the beginning. Yeah. 
um, but I think it's not unusual now for people to turn to art as a career, having done something else. Yeah, yeah. And what advice would you give to a stranger now who is starting off? To try to have conviction, to try to listen to your own voice and listen to your own work, as well as listening to other people's advice. I think if I look back at the time where I was at art school, where you have critiques with tutors, etc., etc., they come in to help to facilitate your own dialogue about your work. You don't necessarily have to take on board what they say. They are there as a, as a, as a sounding board, but to recognise that you still need to follow your own path. With all the great advice, with all the great advice, um, is what what to what to hold on to that's true to what you're trying to do, and to also recognise what you can let go. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, welcome back. Thanks very much for joining me for that edition of Art Discussion with the lovely Christy Symington. Now, if you have any burning ideas or questions that you would like me to ask any of the artists that I'm interviewing in the future, then please do put them in the comments section below and I will endeavour to look at them and see if I can include them in my list of questions. If you are already subscribed to my channel, thank you very much. Thanks for being here. If you're not subscribed, then please do subscribe so that you can get you can keep up to date with the latest interviews like this one until next time take care bye